of this portrait, which in its principal features underwent little alteration in the last years of his reign. I will add some particulars furnished with my long intimacy with him. When excited by any violent passion, his face assumed an even terrible expression, a sort of rotary movement very visibly produced itself on his forehead and between his eyebrows. His eyes flashed fire, his nostrils dilated, swollen with the inner storm. But these transient movements, whatever their cause may have been, in no way brought disorder to his mind. He seemed to be able to control at will these explosions, which, by the way, as time went on, became less and less frequent. His head remained cool. The blood never went to it, flowing back to the heart. In ordinary life, his expression was calm, meditative, and gently grave. When in a good humor or when anxious to please, his expression was sweet and caressing, and his face was lighted up by a most beautiful smile. Amongst familiars, his laugh was loud and mocking. The stoutness which grew upon him in the last years of his reign developed his trunk more than the lower part of his body, a circumstance which made people say after his fall that his bust gave the idea of an imposing and majestic monument, the pedestal of which was not at all proportioned to its greatness. My portrait of Napoleon would be incomplete, did I not mention the hat, without trimming or lace, which was ornamented by a little tricolor cockade fastened with a black silk cord, and the great surtout, which covered the simple uniform of Colonel of his guard, this hat and his surtout, which became historical with him, showed in the midst of the coats covered with gold and silver embroidery which were worn by his generals and the civil and military officers of his household. The contradictory opinions pronounced by Napoleon's schoolmasters or school inspectors go to prove that as a boy he gave no signs of what he was to be one day. As a matter of fact, it was not until he left the military school that he gave himself up with ardor to study. He has often told me that since that date, he has constantly worked 16 hours a day. Nevertheless, he already had within him the germs of the qualities which were brought out by education and which, under the influence of events, developed to the highest degree. These dominating qualities were pride and a sentiment of his dignity, a warlike instinct, a genius for form the love of order and of discipline. As a child, an unjust and humiliating punishment distressed him to the point of injuring his health. A gratuitous insult to his father's name provoked him to demand a reparation by arms. Even at the cost of the loss of his career, he was then about 14 years old. At the same age, during the winter of 1783 to 1784, at the head of his comrades, he collected the snow, which had fallen abundantly in the court of the school at Brienne, and used it to construct forts and redoubts, which were then besieged under his orders, snowballs and cannonballs of ice being used as projectiles. He was at one and the same time engineer and general. Arriving at the Paris military school at the age of 16, he found his school used to a system of practicality and laxity, which shocked his precocious mind. On this occasion, he addressed a memorandum to the sub-principal in which he indicated a plan of reform, the principal points of which he afterwards applied to the schools of Fontainebleau, Saint-Cyr, and Saint-Germain, one holiday at Brienne, being charged with the direction of a performance of the charity of Caesar's death, he endeavored to keep order at the theater. The wife of the college porter, who had no ticket of admission, thinking herself authorized by her position of servant of the house, made a disturbance at the door, trying to push in in spite of the order given. She drew down on her head a sharp rebuke from the officer Bonaparte, which it once reestablished order. Remove this woman who brings into our midst the license of the camp. <laughs>
Those who knew Napoleon in his youth agree in saying that his nature was gentle, reserved, and pensive, that he had little taste for noisy pleasures and more inclination for the sciences than for accomplishments. He did, however, it is said, sacrifice to the muses. There are, we are assured, some pieces of poetry of his in existence, but these are only short and are mere attempts. I have never heard that he admitted writing them. On this point, I may add that I have more than once had the opportunity to hear him express himself on the art of poetry in general, with the exception of true poetry, in which he recognized the elevation of ideas united to a brilliancy of style. He looked on versification as a frivolous occupation, which caused a great and useless waste of time. The mechanism of poetry, the restraint of the hemistish, and their rhyme were not at all suited to the abandon and vivacity of his ideas. Napoleon was a born poet. His vast thoughts, the originality of his speech and his style, his proclamations testify to a strong and fruitful imagination. As with Plato, there was more poetry in his prose than in the verses of many poets, and like Plato also, he would have been disposed to conduct crowd with flowers every poet over the frontier of the republic i have had in my hands a little pocketbook the keeping of which he had entrusted to me this pocketbook contained his principal papers his certificate of baptism his contract of marriage some letters and a few sheets of paper on which thoughts and short compositions all in prose were written no traces of any attempt at poetry existed. This, however, is not a proof that he never wrote poetry. This makes me speak of an article which appeared some years ago in the Review des Deux Mondes, the Review of Two Worlds, which announced the discovery of papers containing the youthful productions of Napoleon, partly in his handwriting. The story of this discovery seems to me to resemble a good deal the trick of the novelist who tries to excite public curiosity by stating that his manuscript was found in some old ruin or in some vault which had not been entered for centuries. I may recall that according to this story, the papers had been confided to Colonel Fesch, who was certainly not the confident that Napoleon would have chosen that the cardinal handed them over to a priest of his diocese when he left Lyon, that this priest abandoned the box in which they were locked up, that the grocer brought this box, and so on. It is a highly improbable tale. Having thus digressed on the childhood and early youth of Napoleon, I must not let the occasion pass to mention what was one of the leading traits of his moral character? I mean the respect which he always showed for his parents and for his great uncle, the Archdeacon, <laughs> the Archdeacon Lucian, who became, after the death of his nephew, Charles Bonaparte, the head of the family. Napoleon was 15 years old when his father, who had brought him to France at the age of 10, died in Montpellier. The letters which he wrote to his mother and to his great uncle on that occasion show the sorrow which he felt at this loss. Napoleon had almost always been separated from his father and knew him but little. Charles Bonaparte had not been able to look after the education of his children. He had entrusted that duty to Madame Bonaparte, a woman of strong character, who had fulfilled her maternal duties with a tender and severe solicitude. She had inspired her children with no sentiments, but such as were elevated and generous, and whilst developing their good natural characters, had been careful to remove from them all examples which might might have tainted their innocence. It was in 1787, whilst at the Paris Military School, that Napoleon lost his father, who died in the arms of his son, Joseph. Abbe Fesch, who afterwards became a cardinal, and Madame de Pyrmont, mother of the Duchess de Brantes, were present. Charles Bonaparte told his son that he wished him to give up the military career, which kept him separated from his family, and would be pleased to see him return to Corsica to take his place. 
he recommended his six other sons to his care, mentioning each one by name and made a promise that he would be a father to them as far as his age would allow. Joseph was then 17 years old. In 1802, the municipal councillors of Montpellier voted the erection of a monument to the memory of Charles Bonaparte. Napoleon thanked the councillors for their good intentions, but considering that his father's death had taken place 18 years before, replied to their proposal with the words, If I had lost my father yesterday, it would be proper and natural that I should accompany my regrets with some high mark of respect. But this occurrence took place nearly 20 years ago and is therefore not one of public interest. If he refused this homage, it was chiefly because he saw it was intended rather for his personal glory than in honor of the memory of his father. Louis Bonaparte has since had the body of his father exhumed and transported to his St. Louis estate, where a monument has been erected. Napoleon went to see his family in Corsica at the time he was artillery lieutenant at Valence. It was then long since his uncle, the Archdeacon Lucien, crippled with gout, had been forced to take to his bed. Touched by the sight of his suffering, young Bonaparte, who was then barely 18 years old, wrote to Dr. Tissot in secret, carefully describing in his letter the state of the invalid and imploring him with touching solicitude, appealing to his science and humanity for advice as to the cure or at least as to the relief of his uncle. This letter was never answered it was no doubt lost among the number of letters asking for consultations and signed by strangers which the great doctor received. Five years later, Napoleon obtained fresh leave of absence and without delay took advantage of it to return to Corsica, where he found his great uncle on his deathbed. This sad sight recalled to him vividly the kindness with which this worthy man had always treated his nephews and himself. Napoleon in particular, the version of the words which Archdeacon Lucien addressed to them, which is generally accredited to him, was incorrect. He was bitterly regretted by his nephews, to whom he had been a second father, and his family lost in him a guide and a protector. Napoleon united in the same gratitude the memories of this good kinsman and of his father." I could never weary of examining the room in which I found myself since my admission to the Tuileries. And I kept looking at the papers which covered Napoleon's bureau, but had scruples to touch them, as I could not imagine that from the first day he had accorded me a confidence of which I knew him to be a cherry, and of which I did not fancy myself worthy." The room which he had made his study was moderately large and was lighted by a single window constructed in an angle and looking out on the garden. The principal object of furniture was a magnificent writing table placed in the middle of the room and covered with gilt bronze, the legs being in the form of griffins. The table was a sort of square box and the lid was a sliding one so that it could be closed without disturbing the papers. The chair was antique in form, the back being covered with a drapery of green cursy mirror, pleated and fitted with silk cords. The arms ended in griffin heads. The first consul, as a rule, never sat down to his writing table except to sign. His usual place was on a settee covered with green taffeta, besides which stood a small table on which the day's post was laid. Every morning, the letters of the previous day were removed from this little table and laid on the writing table to make room for the day's letters. A screen of many folds shielded him from the heat of the fire. My writing table was placed within reach of his. This arrangement of the interior of his workroom was followed in all the palaces and residences which Napoleon occupied. There was never any back cabinet. But when space allowed it, the maps which he was constantly using were placed in an adjoining room. 
to which the head of the topographical bureau only came when he was summoned. When it was necessary for Napoleon to follow the subject with which he was dealing on the map, I used to go into this room to write from his dictation. At the far end of the study were two large bookcases placed in the corners, and between them was one of those large clocks, which are called regulators. A long glazed cupboard was against one of the walls. It was of breast height and had a marble top and contained some cardboard cases. There were also some chairs in the room and a bronze equestrian statuette of Frederick the Great of Prussia. Such was the simple furniture of the consul's workroom. The only luxurious object was the writing table, which had been bought at the industrial exhibition as a masterpiece of the skillful manufacturer BNA. The simplicity of Napoleon's tastes was shown here as clearly as in everything touching his person. The only dependency of the consul's cabinet was a topographical bureau or map room, which was under the charge of an officer who had been formerly attached to the staff of General Clark and whose son, Monsieur Cuvillier Fleury, a distinguished man of letters, after studying brilliantly and carrying off the prize of honor at Louis le Grand, directed the education of His Royal Highness the Duke d'Aunala and became his secretary of commands. The librarian was Monsieur Ripo, who had followed General Bonaparte in the Egyptian campaigns. He was an erudite literateur and a learned bookman, and had been a member of the Commission of Science and Arts at Cairo and secretary to General Kleber. In 1807, he suddenly became disgusted with his post without giving any reason for the same. It was suspected that he was offended at his subordination to Abbe Denina. This savant, author of Revolutions in Italy and many other valuable works, and formerly librarian too, Frederick the Great, had been presented to the emperor at Mayence. Napoleon wished to give him a proof of his admiration and to show him how highly he esteemed his talents, and nominated him his first librarian, a title which was, however, purely honorary. Emperor ordered me to invite Monsieur Ripo to come back to his post, which he had abandoned, retiring to live in the country near Orléans. I wrote him several urgent letters, which he left without an answer. The Emperor was then obliged to arrange for a substitute. I drew his attention to Monsieur Barbier, who in the literary world held the scepter of bibliography. I had had occasion to appreciate the extent of his knowledge of this science, for I had been under his orders for a short time after I left school. When he had been commissioned to form the libraries, the directoire, and of the legislative council, every voice being in his favor, the learned bibliographer was appointed the emperor's librarian. Monsieur Barbier is the author of the Dictionnaire des Anonyme, the Dictionary of the Anonymous, and of many bibliographical and philological works which are distinguished by scientific research and a judicious critical spirit. Monsieur Emide Jaubert, who has since become peer of France and a member of the Academy of Inscriptions and Belles Lettres, was secretary interpreter of oriental languages to the government. In this capacity, he undertook a great number of translations for the cabinet. He enjoyed the entire confidence of the first consul as a translator. Many of the translations with which he was entrusted being of the highest importance. Monsieur Le Lorgne de Deville, who has since become maître de requête, master of requests, to the Council of State and a member of the Chamber of Deputies was some years later attached to the cabinet as secretary interpreter of northern languages. Monsieur 
Dieteville had lived many years in Germany, Poland, Russia, Sweden, and Denmark as attaché to different French legations in those countries. He was charged in the cabinet with an important work, which consisted of extracting from the dispatches of our diplomatic agents and from foreign publications information as to the composition and movements of the enemy's armies and to give a resume of this information in a detailed report. Monsieur de Deville's reports were drawn up with such clearness and exactness that the emperor knew the condition of foreign armies as well as he knew that of the French armies. During his campaigns in Russia and Germany, Monsieur de Deville constantly followed the emperor on horseback. It was his duty to question prisoners and the inhabitants of the country through which they were passing and to translate contents of letters or reports which might come into his hands. The emperor, thanks to the zeal and penetration of Monsieur de Deville, thus obtained information which was often of the highest interest to him. Napoleon was surrounded by living reminders of his youth. He had with him, besides Brienne, Colonel Lauriston, who had also been in school with him at Brienne. Father Dupuis, formerly schoolmaster in his town, was living in peaceful and honorable retirement at La Malmaison. Although there were very few books there, and these were in Napoleon's study, which Monsieur Dupuy never entered, he enjoyed the title of librarian. He was an excellent man and literally worshipped his former pupil. He had retained from his management of the Brienne School the practice of domestic economy rather than a taste for books and study. He had principally occupied himself there with the cultivation of vineyards. At Malmaison, there were no longer the precious vines of Champagne to be inspected, but Monsieur Dupuy bought plots of standing vines at Garces and at certain, and by means of a certain process, removed the greenness and acidity of the grapes for which Seren wine had been proverbially notorious and was able to produce sweet and sparkling champagne wine. The house porter at La Malmaison was a man called Ote, who had formerly been a porter at the Brienne School. This excellent man and also his wife had found pleasant quarters here also. The two brothers, de Mazis, who had been with Napoleon at the military school, were not forgotten. The elder was appointed director of the state lottery in 1806, and the younger, who had been Napoleon's particular friend, was provided with the place of director of the crown furniture. During the 100 days, he filled the office of Chamberlain.